This episode of Vintage Stormfront Freaks has been previously recorded. excited about this uh tonight we welcome gary england he's well known for his time as a tv meteorologist with kwtv news 9 in oklahoma where he received four heartland emmy awards and has been the recipient of numerous other honors including the prestigious national edward r morrow award for coverage of a tornado event in 2015, he was appointed by the Oklahoma Board of Regents as a University of Oklahoma Consulting Meteorologist in Residence. And back in 1981, Gary became the first person, I love this, the first person in history to use Doppler radar for direct warnings in the public, which is the way we do it now. This yeah. is the way the way it, it is. In, it's great that he did this to start us off. Uh, besides appearing in the Steven Spielberg movie Twister, He's also been sought after as a consultant for tornado weather specials produced by national and international television channels, uh, appearing in over 60 productions. He's also a graduate of the University of Oklahoma and has a Bachelor of Science degree in mathematics ooh, and meteorology. Yeah. So, Gary, like one of my questions, and that's, I was so excited to talk to you, is you have a four-decade-long career. And... I would want to ask myself this questions after four decades, like really, what are you most proud of? I mean, to, to look at your career, you've done so much, you've gotten so many awards, but really what was the thing you're most passionate and proud of? The fact that I, I kept a job for 42 years. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was like, you yeah. hung in there for that long. Uh, too. MTV too. Yeah. My daddy wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. I was just amazed when I looked at your bio and I looked at, you must have a, probably a hundred awards or more than that. I mean, wow. yeah, it was did. just incredible what you have had over four decades. Just, just incredible. They're, they're nice, but you know, you can't, you can't eat them. Uh, no, true. Yeah. Good point. I, yeah. And so it's nice. And I, I appreciate all that, but I just was happy to have a job and be able to take care of my family and my yeah. daughter and now my two granddaughters and, uh -huh. and actually have a car to drive, you know, it's exciting, <laughs> man. There you go. <laughs> a laptop you can talk to yeah. about? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. Great. If you look, if you look over his shoulder, I think uh, he's got a couple of his Emmys back there actually strategically placed oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. No, no they sit there i put my mail on them actually <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so, gary how close does a tornado come to your house oh to my house and uh, a small one hit uh, several years ago and just damaged part of the roof but uh as far as the large tornado can you know it's not that far um, far enough but, but i like it maybe five miles something like that you mm. know wow Mile That's wide. I, I like I like how it said, man, you know, I had a little small one that you know, <laughs> I've never seen one. So many. It's, that's pretty pretty common probably yeah, in Oklahoma to go, yeah, I've had a couple little ones, but mm -hmm. nothing big. Mm -mm -mm. Now Gary, is, is that your favorite? Would you say that's your favorite part about weather, or like watching the weather, or what's your favorite weather phenomenon, would you say? Oh well, you know, I really don't like severe weather. Um, really? Yeah, it's it's high stress, people mm -hmm. die. You know, yeah. and it's, yeah. uh, well, it's not a lot of fun in that respect. My best part of it for me, when I, I just love doing my show, and I always felt like if mm -hmm. I, could just, I could just make someone smile or cause them to smile at home, because most people go to work, they have a real nasty day, you know, yeah. and they come home, and if you can help help them, if, if I screw up, and I'm not, you know, I'm not eloquent at all, if I screw up, they can laugh at me, and I think they feel better, so it, it's worked pretty well, but it's just doing my regular shows. Wow. That's, that's great. That's, that is great. I know so, that we, we all get kind of excited about severe weather, but we agree that, you know, we, we, we know that, you know, what it, the kind of problems it can cause people. So yeah, well, good. Cause that's a great way to go to work every day. I think I'm going to make somebody smile. I like that, hopefully, Gary. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Gary, Hey, I heard that Oklahoma city is the highest probability of having a 20 is like one in 400 chance or something. Is that right? Well, that sometimes that doesn't even count in the South part of the city. They've been hit about, well, you get in more, more Oklahoma, just South of Oklahoma, suburb. Yeah. Gosh, how many times they've been hit in the last few years? Mm -hmm. well, several I times. Count, yeah. Large. Four F5s or something, right? Uh, they had an F3 in, in, mm -hmm. in 60. Gosh, not 60. 
So anyway, whatever year it was, <laughs> at night, it was an October outbreak, Western Oklahoma, and normally they don't last very long, and they're not quite as strong, and had an F4 with that, but we ended up about, I think, roughly, I'm guessing, 20 tornadoes, made it all the way to central Oklahoma, and about 10 o'clock at night, one was coming through more Oklahoma from the south, I believe that was 98, yeah, and uh, it's coming from the south. Just, just west of Interstate 35, man. And we got the great video, you know, of the, the power flashes and all that. And then after that, you know, you had the 99, you had the 13. There's been some other ones in between the 04s, yeah. oh, whatever they are. They've been a, so for there, you know, it's like, I don't know what the probability be. It's relatively, <coughs> relatively high. Right. So how do they get people to move to more Oklahoma? That's what I want to know. You know, <laughs> listen, I interviewed, uh, uh, what is his name? Uh, Braden. Uh, he works for Channel 4, NBC here in Oklahoma City, and he's fairly new in the business. And I interviewed him, and he and he moved to Moore, and he knows the way. He went to school to OU for four years, and I said, "Why do you do that, man?" Because <laughs> so they said, "Well, you know, you do get to see more weather down there." <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you see a lot of stuff, man. Houses going by, cars in the air, <laughs> cows. <laughs> so, so, Gary, hey, what county do you live in, and what county is Oklahoma, Oklahoma City county. in? It's in Oklahoma. It's called Oklahoma County, and just south of us to it baby uh yeah. it's uh it's uh, more oklahoma is just south of us and okay. so there's there have been huge tornadoes in this area for a long time but the huge ones you know they occur elsewhere but these suckers are something else <laughs> i gotta tell you oh it's a it's a little you know i remember in the the uh, uh the, the one guy came through you know, with the dopper on wheels on it, you know, and they found out the winds were possibly as high as 318 miles per hour. And, you know, that we had eight supercells that day. Tell me if I'm running long or anything, okay? No, yeah, you're fine. No, you're good. Through. Go ahead. Uh, I believe we had eight, eight supercells that day. And it was a day uh, where people weren't really sure what was going to happen, you know. We thought, yeah, it'll be thunderstorms and a few tornadoes and good God, it almost blew the whole state away. But uh, <laughs> the, the, when first we started down in southern Oklahoma, this is the big one hit Oklahoma City and, and killed all the people. It, it came up it's right near Lawton, Oklahoma, probably about 110 miles, 20 miles south. It blew up fast, man. Boom, little skinny tornado, you know. Yeah. And that, then we watched that. We had live, you know, had live video on it from the helicopter. And then that quickly dissipated. He's like, hey, it's probably gone. Bam, it came back just a little bit bigger. And by that time, other ones are going up. Other storms are going up to our, to the west and to the south. And it was interesting. It wasn't like a line. You know, the air mass was extremely unstable. And it had all the good lift. I had all the things you needed. And, man, those things were going up everywhere. And so mm -hmm. at some point, you know, we cover Oklahoma City, which is about 600 square miles, plus the western two-thirds of Oklahoma, which is gigantic in size. Mm -hmm. So we have to watch all those towns, watch the Oklahoma City area. But that one came up, and it was, it was just quite fascinating. It just kept coming. <clears throat> it cycled several times. Every time it cycled, it uh, got a little bit bigger. And, uh, you know, it finally got with about 40 miles of the Oklahoma City area. Of course, we had the warning out for here, of course. Everyone did. But it's coming toward Oklahoma City. And that's, I just said to myself, God, it is coming to the city, you know. We didn't, hadn't had one like that in well, forever. It was, a, it, was a, it was a historical event. And uh, it went near Chickasha, about 40-some miles out, went a little bit to the north. I've got to tell you, and it was, it was about three-quarters of a mile wide at that point. It just disappeared. And we're all looking at the live mm. video going, oh, my God. Oh. And then it just came back. And it was about a mile and a half, two miles wide for a little ways. And we had one of our storm trackers was there. And it was so darn wide, he couldn't get it in his viewfinder. And he, and he wasn't real close. And, uh, wow. and oh my god, it, it just kept coming in, you know. And that and that was the last time it cycled, I believe. Not one of the time past it, but anyway, it just kept coming, it, you know. And when on, on the warnings that day, I said to the people, you know, you don't go outside and look at this thing because it will kill you. <laughs> and the next yeah. thing I said was, because uh, I've said tornado warning take cover, you know, all jillions sure. of times. But I, I said, you know, it'll kill you. And then a few minutes later, I said, most structures will not. Uh, withstand these winds Ooh. and a little while later I two three minutes whatever it was I said uh, you need to move to a place of safety if you can get below ground do and uh, fortunately we still had about mm, 30 minutes before it got into more and everything but it was it was just a true monster it was, it was fascinating to watch uh, you know the entire mesocyclone was on the ground yeah. now it narrowed a little bit as it went into more Oklahoma to about a quarter of a mile that's when the winds uh, winds went up to about 
318 or so. Wow. So it was a loss, man. It was just a this loss. This was the 99 tornado, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The May 3rd? Okay. Right. Yeah. When, okay. Gary, when was the first time you remember that you guys had live footage, uh, tornado footage, whether it's chopper or on the yeah. ground? And, and what's been some of the viewer feedback that has come back um, when they actually get a chance to see it live on air? Pardon me, I'm going to have a little drink here. There we go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it looks, like, looks like vodka, but it's not. <laughs> uh, the first thing I remember well about that, uh, first time we had live coverage from a helicopter, and probably first time we had live coverage ever of a tornado was 1981. It was the Binger tornado. It was about three quarters of a mile wide, and it was another hoss. And mm-hmm. it came in the southwest. It just came from Binger, which is west of Oklahoma City, came up fairly close to Oklahoma City, and then dissipated. And we had a little tiny helicopter, and it had enough to have four people in there, but they shot out the window. The audio was great. Uh, they, they were pretty excited. They got caught in the inflow to it. And the pilot told me later, he said he probably had about another five seconds or they would, they would have gone down, but he was able to get out of it. And these guys, mm-hmm. you know, you know how news guys are. They can cuss, baby. And then they got caught in the, the hail and all that and had to land on the interstate. But that was 81. And that was the first time I think anybody really had done it like that. And so it's pretty darn exciting, you know, and we didn't know we were doing something smart, you know. <laughs> we looked really good, but we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> Instead of getting that helicopter and take a camera. <laughs> that's uh, that's but, why the, the audio was too good, is what you're saying, if they were yeah. time, right? Yeah, and it was, and that, part of the time, you know, they were flat live, and they were, it was screaming, but it was, it was fascinating stuff. But the f- viewer feedback, a lot of time was, you know, you're interrupting Jeopardy. Get the hell off there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, guys, ever hear that? Yeah. But most people were very <laughs> thankful. It, you know, it became entertainment for some people. Here's the way I look at tornadoes. He's coming down the road, baby. And you, you're right in front of it. You're really concerned, baby. Where is it? Where's it going? What time is it going to get to my house and all that? But if it's going to somebody else over to the left or the right and it's going to go between, they become, it's kind of like the NASCAR. They all yeah. gather around, so to speak, to watch it go through and the houses go mm-hmm. up and everything go up in the air. And so you got the people who are really interested and you got the ones that are very fearful, but you got the ones that are just, they're tourists, so to speak. But they're okay. Yeah. Okay. And they watch all this stuff. And, but the, the feedback has always been good until, uh, you know, recent years when there's so much hype and so much, mm-hmm. you know, look at this and it's the biggest in the world and it's whatever. And, and, and they, and a lot of times, I don't know about other markets, but I know in this market, uh, they're on the air when they don't need to be on the air, there's a rain share. And that's the audience reaction right now is get the heck off. You know, I don't need to know about a range, uh, a range shower. And so it's, it's a mixed. Now, if, if it's a bad mm-hmm. tornado, like the more tornadoes we've had, yeah. some of the mm-hmm. other ones, and people's lives are saved, you know, they're thankful for about two days. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Then they're back to get the hell off Jeopardy zone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes, yeah, there you go, baby. Uh, back, in, back in the 80s, there was a big tornado west of Oklahoma City big mesocyclone and it was all rotating and had a nice hook echo it had all the features you, know, you expect and uh we were we were covering it no tornado just a beautiful mesocyclone and all that and the tornado warning you know, during jeopardy and something else and we stayed on the air and, and a guy wrote me a letter after that actually an email and he said uh, Oh God, how'd he put that? But anyway, he was, uh, he called me a lot of different names and he was really mad because he'd missed his programs. Well, the next day we had a, like a tornado outbreak on the exact date and it was, it was serious. In fact, I think this was, this, when he, when that happened, it was the day before uh, the 99 tornado, I believe something like that. Anyway, yeah. he wrote me this email and it was long, man. I still have it. It was long, long, long. And he's he's pretty fearful that God was going to get him for raising Cain the next day about you know the fact oh, that yeah. trying to say. I mean, he really he really felt guilty and he he deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, That's Gary, kind of nice. You actually see somebody feel bad about something they say yeah, though, seriously. or hear it. Yeah. 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 Now, Gary, I think uh, with Jeopardy, it was actually Wheel of Fortune that was on. With it, <laughs> yeah. Just to let you know. Yeah, so, no one ever okay. got mad about interrupting Jeopardy. No, that's a fact. <laughs> Jeopardy, you know, that, they're the worst. Yep, yep. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> you know, tornado has to be at their doorstep before they want to be warned. Uh-huh. The yeah. Jeopardy folk. <laughs> so, Gary, yeah. you know, you, you've obviously have, you know, a lot of a lot of probably skills at this point, like looking at the radar because, you know, that was what you did for a while. 
um, being able to have to identify storms and whether they were going to form into a tornado or not because you had to be ready to go in the air. Um, you know, what would you recommend, you know, I guess else than just looking at the radar in terms of, you know, how do you kind of identify a storm else than, you know, a hook or um, the velocity, you know, how do you identify if it's going to produce a tornado or not? Um, well, some, sometimes we still don't know that, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. years yeah. ago, you know, uh, we did a lot of plotting analysis of surface maps, you know, every hour and everything like that going on. And we, had, we really used the storm trackers through the years. I think the first storm tracker I hired uh, was in 1991 and mm -hmm. uh, Val Castor's it was. And he took more pictures of his foot that day than he did the tornado. Because <laughs> you know, he like this. You see the tornado in the video, then you see his leg, and he's he yeah. this routine. But uh, <laughs> we used those guys, and, they were, and we put them out where we thought something might happen. And, and they, were, they became very good at looking just at the field observations. Mm -hmm. uh, with the radar, with the radars we used many years, the, the analogs, they were, let me tell you, they have high, high resolution, black and white. And you can attenuate, attenuate out part of the, 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 the echo. And I remember one time the, the, wood, the uh, Stillwater tornado came in from the northwest, had winds about 180 miles per hour. And it was just a big old thunderstorm. And I took out about uh, two and then 20, maybe 30 dBZ. And that just reduces the size that you look inside the storm. And curled up in there like a snake was that mm -hmm. tornado. Came right over the campus and touched down the south part of, of uh, Stillwater. But so we... With those radars, you could see the hook echo, and we could check for the vault. You know, we could check, is there a vault, or is there a battered weak echo region, those things. And then from the field reports, we were pretty good, but not, you know, that good. Even today, you know, you're still not sure if a storm's going to produce mm -hmm. a tornado. But mm -hmm. with all the technology, man, you know, it, you know, I've been out to the TV business uh, three years. It's relatively easy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like I can put my dog on there and he can just sniff over there. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, it gives you where the, the, the where we have the most shear, you know, where the best winds are. It was just, God, it's just incredible what they have now. Yeah, my life would have been a lot easier if I'd had that a long time ago. Oh, yeah. Chris, what did you have when you first started? That's, I was kind of wondering, like, did you have the magnet board when you first started? <laughs> did you draw it? Did you draw it on a board? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ten cans, <laughs> two ten cans of wire between them. Uh, that works, by the way. Uh, well, we had, uh, we had, yeah, the, uh, David Grant was the guy. His real name was David Gill. He was there, Channel Nine before me. But uh, he had his four, two, had four sides, two of them big drums, you know, and then you roll them around. Didn't want to leave your hand down because they came down and smash your fingers. They were magnetic, really ugly blue, and you'd had to put magnet stuff and all that kind of stuff. And our magnets were so, so old, they, during the show, you put it up too early, they start sliding down. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Southern, it's a southerly yeah, flow. Yeah, yeah. So what we have, well, we had the magnetic maps, uh, we didn't, the Channel 9 didn't have a radar, but we quickly bought one from Enterprise, a small one, uh, only about 50, 50,000 watts, something like that. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't too strong. Uh, no, a no. couple blocks away from the studio. Yeah. <laughs> you, you had no idea what you had. You didn't know whether it was a rainstorm or hailstorm or whatever. But uh, then very quickly after that, we moved on to more sophisticated radar and, and those were good. But when I first started, it was, it was basically, we used chalk right on there. And, yeah. And I spent a lot of time. I had a seven-minute show, man, on like on, at around six o'clock. Yeah, wow. seven I mean, minutes every, every day? day. That's a dream. Every yeah. day, what? every day. Uh -huh. you no, know, I I run out of anything to say it two or three minutes. <laughs> but it was a, start it was over. Just start over. Interesting do it again. time. <laughs> uh, we had some, you know, some people in the field for news, a little bit in the weather. But it was just a different world, and and Oklahoma City had not been. I think you have to take a market and make it a a, a severe weather market. Yeah. Not by mm -hmm. scaring people, but by good equipment, good meteorologists, mm -hmm. and doing what needs to be done, and uh, you, you could build it. And we 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 were very fortunate. We built it, uh, but early on, like I said, a little magnetic stuff, and then we got. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I had a company I put together. I got this bright idea with a couple other guys, and we thought we'd make those big, still plastic plastic maps. All the information was on the backside. The audience couldn't see it. Man, they were great stuff and magnetic, and, and you glued it to this big board, and we did some big ones. It was, one was about, I don't know, like 20 feet across. This is over like in, somewhere in Missouri, and they bought that from us, and they 
spent a lot of ma money. And I didn't get to see this, but I got to see the tape later. The guy was on the 10 o'clock show. And I don't know why he ran long, but the lights caused the glue to become loose. And they, oh. they said, oh, they're on the national map. And they said about 200 numbers and letters, are, they jumped off the board. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's weird. And, was, and we had to give them the money back. You know how that is. Oh, that's just wrong. But with a series of those, before the, the great uh, that we have now where, you know, shows where the tornado is, where the people are, and the time of arrival and all that, we had a great big board. I took nine. U.S. Coast, uh, U.S. Coast Geodetic Survey maps, nine of them, cut them, and glued them together, put them on this big board, and it was great. It was like, it's like you're zooming in with your radars now, and, but they just drew them in, show my hand, and it was, it was for his time, it was way ahead of his time, but my boss decided he, he was going to drill little holes where all the towns were, and he was going to put Christmas lights on there. And so when the morning come out, there's a light up. Of course, they moved on to something else. That must but, have been beautiful. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was just gorgeous, I can tell you. It was lit, Phil. It was lit. Yeah. It was working on our yeah. terms. Oh, Brady. Well, your term was lit. I remember Gary said Hoss, and I'm just saying, uh, Gary, Brady was not born during the Bonanza time. I so. don't even know what that is. So. Exactly. You want to explain Hoss? <laughs> well, we'll come up with something else there. How about, how about Pilgrim? <laughs> nope, that doesn't nope. bring any bells. John, John, John Wayne. John Wayne. John Wayne. Oh, yeah. John Wayne. Oh, John Wayne. Wayne. Oh, John Wayne. Oh, I know Wayne's, Wayne's world. world. I don't know that either. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, you Wayne's know. World. So sad. So sad. So sad. <laughs> Ask these kids, some of the, some producers and weather guys out there say, you, "Do you know?" I was going through the name. Do you know Red Skeleton? You remember him? <laughs> they don't remember anybody because they were they were they were dead. They were I mean they were not alive. <laughs> God, so, you stay in that place so long, you know. You see, and you know, like on the news directors I had, you know, uh, I gave them numbers. And last count, I, I guess maybe it's 40, 42, something like that. Four, four, I don't know, a lot of them. <laughs> and because uh, they can't, uh, you know, guy hired me. I got the job. And I, when I went to work about two weeks later, uh, he was gone. They had another guy. And it was just bang, bang, bang. It, just, uh, it was crazy. As you guys know how television is. And mm -hmm. a lot of times in, the, in those days, it was just, hey, walk with me. And they walk you to the door and say, see you, buddy. And that's what they did. There was no anything. It's a so your, business. your um, wife is not like the general manager's daughter or anything, right? From <laughs> no. before. <laughs> Keep your job. <laughs> no, I was really, I was really lucky. You know, I'm not real good. I just lucky. Right time, right so, place. Had terrible weather here. You make it into a weather market, and it worked for me. Wonderful. Tonight we introduce James Spann. He is the chief meteorologist for ABC 3340 in Birmingham, Alabama. And all James has been uh, a television weather anchor for over 36 years. Along the way, he's worked for WSFA in Montgomery, uh, KDFW in Dallas, and two other stations in Birmingham. He is a multiple Emmy winner. James has received yeah. the two highest awards in the nation for broadcast meteorologists. One is the Broadcaster of the Year by NWA, and the other was the AMS, which is the um, Award for Broadcast Meteorology. He's a panelist on the Weather Brains podcast, and he's also earned a, his first ham radio license at the age of 14 and holds an extra class license. So, nice. James, kind of a slacker, man. <laughs> but you know, honor, honor to honor to be here i'm so glad because uh, i mean tonight was even my night off i'm like no i gotta talk to james but you were saying before the show that you have like an 18 hour day so what's your day like when you come in well you know i, I think doesn't everybody on this show work long hours i don't know anybody yes. that works some yeah. normal day shift that doesn't exist anymore i um, do not meteorology well Maybe him, uh, but yeah, it, well, the, you know, the, the core of the problem when, when I was young, like you guys, um, and by the way, I have underwear older than everybody on this show, which is, uh, <laughs> uh, but when, when I was young, um, Thank you. all I worried about was being on television at night. And now, I mean, let's, let's be real. Who's going to stay up and watch the late news to get the weather because where do they get it right here? Mm. And so this never turns off. Never. And therefore, that puts us in a 24-hour cycle. And 
trying to keep up with that, you just sleep whenever you can. And, and on a typical weekday, uh, I get up at 452, which is a little early for me, maybe not for you guys, Yikes. but, uh, um, I, I get home at midnight and, wow. uh, well, Wait, I, you're getting I, up at 452 and you're going home at midnight. Yep. I, and, and, you know, I need some time to wind down. I just can't go to sleep when I right. go home. So I, I go to bed about one o'clock and get up at four 52 and, and, that's not working. It's not, I know something bad's going to happen on the back end here with this, but it is what it is. And to do this job, right. You kind of have to be in that position, but in the morning I do all the work at home. I've got a green wall and I do, I do a hit on the TV, uh, c commercial television from the house and do the blog and the videos and all the digital stuff. And, and I still speak in schools every day, every day during the school year. Uh, wow. Every day, wow, every single job. day, so, sometimes two a day. Cause that's important. I mean, that, that is a win-win, you know, nice. I, I love kids. They energize me. I love, I, I would be a third grade science teacher if I didn't do this. And I love that. So that's energizing. And then you come up here and work the night shift. You know, th this job is like one to 11. So, uh, but, but, you know, I, I get to do what I love. And if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. So I am very, I am very blessed. Or you know, I'm, I'm disappointed that you're, you're not getting up at 451 and you're waiting until 452. <laughs> yeah, that is, that's pretty lame. Out. Lame. Well, uh, let, let me ask you this, because I think it ties in, James. You're, you're known to always talk about the role of the, of the traditional TV meteorologist and that that role is kind of dying. So working those kind of hours, what, what do you think that new frontier is? if that traditional role is going away. Well, I think for the young people and a lot of, I'm sure younger people listen to this show that want to do meteorology professionally, maybe they're in high school or college. I think it's, it's an exciting time for them. It is changing like a meteor streaking through the night. It will never be Brick Tamlin and Ron Burgundy, mm -hmm. which is basically what we're still doing. I mean, we, we, here we are in 2018 when I walk in that studio in, in an hour or so and do the late news, it's Brick Tamlin and Ron Burgundy, but it will change into something that will be relevant to the next generation. Uh, the, the nice thing about what we do, everybody's got a screen. Um, so our like newspapers, their whole platforms going away. That's not happening with us. Uh, but I, I think what we need to do right now is to build a loyal audience, a loyal following that trusts you, that understands you. They know that you're there when the weather's dangerous and life threatening. And that relationship will pay off in the new world, whatever the new world happens to be. And we do know that, that phones are limited. I mean, come on. The, you, you've heard my term before, probably, and I don't know what you call them, but most of these phone apps are crap apps. They're, they're based on model output statistics. Nobody looks at it. They don't perform well. And, and at some point, people get fed up with that and they want to take it deeper and they, they need somebody to talk them through active weather. And that's the purpose that we serve. And the, the need will always be there. So and a lot of people, you know, that they talk bad about this, you know, the young kids coming up, the college kids. I think they're brilliant. I'm excited about this next generation. So I think they're going to do fine, but it will never, ever be the same thing I'm doing today. Where do you think it's headed? Just all m mobile? Well, you know, the, again, the, our, our model, m most of my income is still derived from television. The same thing I've been doing for 40 years, 40 years this month on television. Oh. But but having said that, that all these people that are watching these products and services on television are old and they're going to die off in the next 10 to 15, 20 years. And I don't think that we're going to replace it with the younger generation because they use exclusively their phone. And that's fine. It's no, no big deal. They're just looking at it on a mobile device. But what's going to happen? We're going to have to take these blocks that we have, these 30 minute blocks and turn it into something that's relevant to them. And it will not be what we do right now. Uh, it's got to be better storytelling. It's got to be. And I think the news people have to think out of the box as well. They got the same problem we do because people get news on their phones. And I don't have a good answer. Nobody has the answer for that. But uh, what I think we have to do, and there's no way to monetize it, is to develop a, a healthy relationship with the world across every platform, whether it's social or whatever else. But that means spending time on the face bag and the Twitter and Instagram <laughs> and the Snapchat. And that's very controversial. Some people hate it and they don't want to deal with it. I do because I think developing that relationship is important. And when you've got that big mass of people that follow you, they, they will carry over to the new format, whatever it happens to be. And again, I'm telling you, when tornadoes start flying, they'll find you. The, the problem we have is that tornadoes only happen even in tornado prone markets like this. What, maybe, you know, 20 days out of the year. So what do you do on the other days? That's what we have to figure out. But but. 
I'm telling you, they will find you on those days when the weather is really, really active and really, really dangerous. So, how? Obviously, you you've been in Alabama for quite a while. Where where did you get James your national following? How did that start? Was that all social media mostly? Yeah, you know, it's 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 odd. We, we started doing this podcast thing. Uh, uh, what years is twenty? Is uh, twelve years ago? Two thousand six. Oh, wow! Man. Wow! So we've been doing weather brains since for 12 years. And, and what I needed was a, I desperately needed a creative outlet because everything I do is really structured and every human being needs a creative outlet. And I, we, and I saw uh, Adam Curry and some of these guys, uh, you know, launching some of these shows and I'm thinking, okay, we can do this. And so we, I never intended on it to be something that people would actually listen to or watch, but <laughs> I think part of it is that early adopter kind of thing on the podcasting side. And the other thing, it's the social media thing. And, and then we, where I'm in a tornado prone market and there's a lot of weather weenies in the country that just love, you know, the, the sexy, severe thunderstorm tornado oh. type stuff. Yeah. They, they, they don't, hey, that's me. They, yeah, they, they don't, they don't love people being hurt, but they love right. the science behind it, which is what we, we all, you know, that's where we all are, I think. And uh, so they are attracted to people that maybe work in places like Oklahoma City and Birmingham in these tornado markets. And I think that's part of it. And then we had a uh, generation lap break here in 2011. Uh, and again, a lot of people started paying attention to what goes on here after that. Mm -hmm. And that brought a lot of people into weather brains. And it's just, I, I don't know. I have no idea. But I, so, I think half the deal is being an early adopter on everything. Sure. Get in there so early. My, my lead up to that is, is, you know, you've won some great awards. You've, you've got national following. My question is why, because I'm sure you've gotten plenty of offers and invites. Why, why have you decided to stay in Alabama? It's the greatest weather market in the world. I mean, yeah. I am not in this to be in a big market. And, and, and the deal is when I was uh, 27, um, I was transferred to Dallas to channel four KDFW as you know, top 10 market, one of the largest markets in the country. I filled in on the CBS morning news. It did all that big market stuff. And it really didn't appeal to me. I love Dallas. I made some marvelous friends there that, that, that are friends for life. I cherished that and I enjoyed my time there, but the diversity of what you get here in this market, it's second to none. Uh, we get the tornadoes and the severe storms, which is what we're known for. We get winter storms, ice storms. Uh, yeah, sure. but the thing, the, the thing we also get is the tropical stuff. You get hurricanes and tropical storms and ha having that diversity for somebody that loves weather, which is the reason I do this. It's just the best. So, uh, and I look at Oklahoma city and Gary England and what he's done over the years. Gary doesn't really deal with tropical out there when he was doing weather. He didn't get that. You look mm -hmm. at Tom Skilling in Chicago. He didn't get the tropical side of it. So we, I'm just blessed to be in a strange position to where you get everything and that's the main reason I've stayed here. I, I think I was born to be standing in front of a green wall in <laughs> Birmingham, Alabama. Plus, it seems, it seems to be like you really have, and when you're in a local market compared to national market, it seems like you have a real rapport with people, with the people you live with, pretty much. You know, the people who live in your neighborhood. Yeah, I you know, I talk a lot with uh, Ginger Z about the differences and you know, Ginger came from local television and, and she's in that national position and I'm in a local position and, and they're both marvelous. They, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. But I do love having that where you're, you're you're blended into the community, you're blended into the culture, especially when you've been here as long as I've been here. I've, I'm old as dirt. Again, <laughs> I, I, I started doing the weather here in the late 1970s and uh, it, you know, you, you're on your third generation of kids teaching them science in school and it's just a marvelous kind of thing. And, and I look back on it and I'll think about the relationships and the friendships and uh, that that's all very special. But, but again, the most important thing is when tornadoes start flying, uh, they're going to turn to this channel and they're going to expect me to be there in front of that green wall, look them in the eyes and know exactly, exactly what they need to know. You, you cannot, you cannot forecast the weather successfully on television. If you don't understand the culture, the geography and the people. You, right. you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And if you stay in a place for a long time, you can figure that out. Now, do you have a green screen in your house? Yes. Uh, my wife is very loving and forgiving. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 I mean, green, this is, you know, green, chroma key green is puke green. It's just yeah. pure puke, nasty green. <laughs> Goes with no, everything. <laughs> nobody in their right mind would put that in a home decor setting, you know? I mean, uh, Where is so, it? Uh, Basement? 
no, it's it's upstairs, oddly enough, not in the basement. It's upstairs. Uh, we built one more house. We're, my next move to the cemetery. But in this house, uh, I've got an upstairs office with uh, – uh, everything I need up there to do these kind of shows and to do television. I'm, I'm on television in the morning here and, uh, it's great. And, and I've got AT and T gigabit fiber, the gigabit. There you go. The, nice. The big so how pipe. are you getting your weather graphics and things? If you're at home, uh, I don't do traditional weather when I'm at home. Uh, there's still a meteorologist here in the building at, at the television station where, where I'm located now. I, they bring me in as the stooge. They bring me as the PT Barnum guy because I see. what 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 I do. I get so much content from people. Uh, for example, tonight since we've been on the show, I've probably gotten over two hundred pictures. Two hundred just since we've been talking here. Oh, really? And I, wow. I've got all this user generated content. This that's across all the platforms, not just Twitter, but all the other ones. And I'll take a lot of user generated content and talk about it. Maybe using it as a teaching moment. Maybe using it, um, you know, to explain something I've not been able to explain for a while. Or to be just a wise guy, you know, a knucklehead, uh, you know, so mm -hmm. our, our morning show is kind of sanitized and they, they, they're afraid to get out of the lines. And I don't care. I, I don't know anything <laughs> about television. I don't know any boundaries. And I think people appreciate that. I, I've had no training in radio or TV or any of this stuff. My, my, my first major was electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, nice. anyway, they, they just bring me in as the knucklehead guy. Man, you got the pipes, though. What a you voice. Sure yeah, you sure do. No, 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 no. What you need to do is go to YouTube and uh, search James okay. Spann 1974. You'll, you'll see where I came from. <laughs> uh, I am from rural South Alabama. I mean, you don't even want to know where I was from. If you so ever, you if used to have the accent. Have you ever heard of Forrest Gump? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Forrest, Forrest Gump was from Greenbow, Alabama. I know the guy that wrote that book. His name is Winston Groom, and uh, I'm on a board with him at a college here. And I asked him, did you pattern Greenbow after Greenville? He said, absolutely. Greenville is where I'm from. It's in the southern part of the state. But that 1974 video was horrible. I was in high school, and I sounded and looked like a greaser. Um, <laughs> and... It, it's taken a long time and, and it never goes away. You just have to kind of hide it. There's a fine line between, you know, having your background and who you are show up. But at the same time, you got to be professional. So it's taken a long time and I still work on it every day. It's a struggle. So, James, so, you, you mentioned your love for weather. Talk about that. Where did that come from? You know, was it an event? Was it, you know, we always ask that question ever on the show. Well, I, you know, again, in, in the summer down there in, in, in the woods, th this is a shocker. Uh, when I was growing up, we didn't have these. Uh, we had no Xbox, no PlayStation, no <laughs> Fortnite, no nothing. What did you do, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a shock. Yep. Electricity? Uh, you, Electricity you know, and water and plumbing? Barely, barely. But we, we just, in the, on the summer days, we go play in the woods all day. And uh, every day in the summer down here, we have these air mass thunderstorms, uh, which we still do. And I was fascinated. You know, I just loved those things. I absolutely fell in love with them. So my first love of weather started with random afternoon convection. But I had one of those sentinel events in my life when I was in second grade down there. Uh, my father abandoned me and my mom. I am a fatherless child. He walked out one night and never came back. He never said goodbye, have a nice life, or see you later. He was gone. Never told me he loved me. To this day, I don't know if he did. And so we would have to move me and my mom. I, I bet you I'm the only, only child on this show. Uh, I have no brothers and no sisters. It was me and my mom and we were broke and we were hurting. And uh, she needed to finish one more year of college to get a job to teach. And they didn't make any money, but we, we had to do something. So we would move to Tuscaloosa when I started fifth grade. And Tuscaloosa is the weather capital of the universe. And I grew up as an older child and Tuscaloosa in the decade of the seventies, which was unstinking believable. Um, I, I saw things that changed my life. The, the biggest was the super outbreak of 1974. Um, and I was a senior in high school that year and my hobby was ham radio. I mean, I, Hey, I was cool, man. I, I had a phone in my car in 1974, <laughs> thanks to the magic of the old auto patch on the repeater. But, they, you know, there were no cell phones and they had a desperate need for communicators to come in and set up ham radio gear. So they allowed me three days off from school to volunteer. And my first assignment was at a small hospital in a small town that was very, very hard hit. And for some reason, I don't know to this day why they did that. They put me in the emergency room and the graphic nature of the people, the, the wounds of those that came in that night. Um, I, I have never talked about it publicly and I've never talked about it privately, not even to my wife. I had night terrors for several years, and uh, I guess I had to experience that. I was 17 years old, and, and 
all of this stuff in the 70s really, really, really gelled it for me. But I still didn't know that it was a viable career option. But again, I, I think what cemented the thing was growing up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama in the decade of the 70s. And having well, a cold radio. Pulse. Ham, yeah, the, the ham, ham radio. radio. Did, ham radio was huge. My, my uh, I, I can't tell you the importance of that. It gave me some friends. I had no friends. I didn't know anybody. I, I was an introvert. I didn't trust people. Quite frankly, I hated people. The thing with my dad really affected me pretty heavily. But I made some good friends. Started going to Ham Fest. My mom would get me there somehow. She sometimes I'd ride a bus. She, it was a different world back then, and I'd be on the nets every night working CW nets. I, I was a Morse code guy. And oh, you were the, okay. The, uh, I, w- I was working those high speed CW traffic nets and I, I was, I was doing 40, 50 words a minute Wow! and, um, got my extra class license when I was in high school that got me into storm spotting. Uh, I w- took one yeah. of the very early classes. This is really before Doswell and Moeller and all the stuff we, we, we've had in, in the last 30 years. And that got me into it. So the ham radio thing was a very important part of that. And quite frankly, it's still a very important hobby today. It, it's I'm, I'm telling you guys hmm. one day. The EMP is going to happen <laughs> one, one day. Something's going to happen. You're going to pick up your phone hey, and it doesn't work. And, James, uh, the, we've talked about this in the past. H- ham radio operators, they're getting older. Um, is that a, do you think that's a dying breed and, and what's, what's going to be the challenge if it is? Yeah. I, you know, I, I totally agree. I mean, if you look at the ham radio population, they're, they're older. The young people now have cell phones and, and I understand that times change that, that look, they've got everything they need. They've got Snapchat, you know, they've got all these things and it's marvelous, but uh, something will probably have, it's never going to go away. And, and there are some young people in ham radio, not, not that many, but there are some young people. But one day we're going to have something. I don't know what it's going to be, some sentinel event, mm-hmm. whether it's a, an, a nuclear detonation, whether it is an EMP, wh- whether it's natural or man-made. And that's going to draw everybody back in because you're going to realize that phone doesn't always work. And by springing right. up a wire in your attic, uh, a simple copper wire and with some fairly inexpensive equipment, you can communicate with somebody in California, mm-hmm. in China, in South America. There's a very sexy appeal to that. And still to me this day, it's magic. And I absolutely love it. So the, the hobby is never going to go away. There's a very strong organization, the American Radio Relay League. A lot of weather weenies have their ham license and uh, they use it extensively in the field. But, uh, yeah, we, it, it will survive and it will be needed one day in a very serious way. They have that a lot in the movies too, don't they? You know, when uh, everything goes goes down, the ham We're radio gonna operators We're are gonna saving the world. Save the world. Everybody's yeah. going to be my best friend. They're going <laughs> to come to my house because I got a radio that works. Like when, James, we're coming over. When yeah, all I'm else, in Georgia. I'm not far. Come on. Come when on. all else fails. <laughs> Now, yep. James, you know, everybody loves you when you have your own bobblehead and memes. Have you guys seen all these? Oh. They're oh, amazing. We're gonna have to see so I uh, need more memes. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't know who makes this stuff. I have no idea. I, I have no earthly Someone's idea. Someone's making money off your likeness. They're right? funny. Oh man, <laughs> they're, 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 you seen the the James Span is my homeboy T shirts. Those things. <laughs> I see. I, I was I was in uh, Denver uh, at a at a baseball game and saw some knucklehead wearing one. He came up wanted to get a picture with me. I'm thinking, what 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 is this? This makes no sense at all. But you know, again. That's fine. And to, to be successful, you do have to have a little bit of P.T. Barnum in you these days. Uh, and, you know, if they want to do that, that's great. I'm, I'm honored. There's a bunch of memes. So listen, <laughs> la- last episode, we got into a discussion about the, the research pioneers like like the late Tim Samaras and the Vortex Project. And, and, and the conversation was a little bit about is, is there w- what's the future of tornado advanced warnings it, can it get better than it is now uh with more data and, and can we ever get to a point to where we can tell a, a town or a community with enough notice to even possibly evacuate um to get out i, I mean can we get better that, than where we are now that, that's Change. a social science question social science question that, that's the question i have for the social scientist how much lead time is too much lead time uh, because if you give people too much lead time, they might do something that's a bad choice. I don't have the answer to that. That's going to come from the social science side of it. But I'll tell you guys right now, this is where we desperately need help. And, and for these large, violent tornadoes that, that are killing most of these people, the, the physical science is pretty darn good, thanks to these brilliant men and women mm-hmm. in this science that have over the years. And, and a lot of you know that one of my mentors and one of my heroes is Chuck Doswell, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and Al Mohler. And I still miss 
Al, and I just loved hearing him talk. And, you know, I got to know him when I was in Dallas. But my, my challenge to those men and women in, in it now in the research side, I need some help with EF zeros and EF ones. Uh, these were not that good. It's whack-a-mole. It is absolute whack-a-mole. And those things can hurt people and they can kill people. But if we try and catch them, the false alarm ratio goes so high that it will ruin the system when we have that big EF4, EF5. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you what happened here in 2011. And, and again, on that day, just for those that don't recall the day, we've had so many you know, fairly big events. In my state alone that day, we had 62 tornadoes that killed 252 people. And these were precious people that died. And one of the things I'm trying to do in my old age, I want to memorize the names of all of them. I'm about halfway there. Um, but, but, that, but listen, y'all, that was easy. From, from the physical science side, issuing warnings for those tornadoes was pretty darned easy. Any third grader could basically look at what was going on here and, and see that these were supercell storms and you could see the hook and you can see a debris ball. And this was before, you know, we had dual pole here, but it was not that hard. The, the problem we have, it's on days like we had uh, last month, an EF1 tornado hit a mobile home in a community north of here. And we're very lucky that nobody was killed, that it could have been very easily, but the tornado did not have a warning. And, and if we try and catch those things, all of a sudden it is whack-a-mole. You warn for this, you warn for that, you warn for this, you warn for that. That forces me on television because there's a very aggressive, severe weather market. And before you know it, people are just lulled to sleep. They hear warnings all the time. Nothing ever happens. Mm -hmm. And they won't do anything. It's the cry wolf syndrome. So I need help from the research side on dealing with uh, EF zeros and EF ones. How do we handle that? My opinion now is that we issue severe thunderstorm warnings for them and mission in the text of the warning. Mm -hmm. This storm is capable of producing a small tornado that would not last long and be aware of that. And you want to go to a safe place anyway. But I, I still think we can advance it further. And we're down here in the land of QLCS tornadoes. Mm -hmm. It's a nightmare, total nightmare. Uh, many of these things are late at night. They're low topped, liter literally under the radar. They last for maybe one or two minutes yep. in a line. The signatures are weak and ill-defined, and we're just not that good. And we have Vortex Southeast going on right now, which is a marvelous project. And we're hoping that some good will come out of that for the practitioners like me that, that will help us in the future. Tell everybody about Vortex Southeast. You know, our, our tornadoes are different. And uh, all the research over the years has been focused on Oklahoma and Kansas. And, and it should be that that's that, that's the weather world capital over there. You know, Norman is the weather center of the universe. And and that's great. But those are drier storms that are low precipitation. Uh, the air mass is much different down here. We have the HP storms uh, that are typically rain wrapped. And we have tremendous impact with orographics, with terrain. We are in the southern end of the Appalachian Mountains here. A lot of people don't know it. In our state, we our peak elevation here is 2407 uh, mm -hmm. in the northeastern part of the state. What role do the mountains have with the storms in terms of strengthening them, enhancing the updraft, responsible for dissipation? Uh, all these questions we have. So for a series of years, we'll have teams in from Oklahoma and SSL, from UAH, which is the organization up in Huntsville that's kind of, you know, coordinating things here to study these southeastern storms. Uh, what makes them different? What what makes them intensify rapidly? Why do they fall apart? Why does one supercell produce a tornado and another one does not? And we're going to get a whole bunch of answers, I think. It's going to be a few years before it all comes back. But again, it is a grunt, as a guy down here in the trenches, I'm very excited. I'm on the steering committee and I go to a lot of the functions and uh, some of the men and women are just brilliant that are working on this project, brilliant researchers. And I can't wait to get the data back. Thank you for tuning in to the Stormfront Freaks podcast. You can watch our bi-weekly show live on youtube.com slash stormfrontfreaks and download the audio version on your favorite podcast player. For links to our Patreon team of exclusive benefits, show notes, past shows, new videos, merchandise, and more, visit our website at stormfrontfreaks.com. While you're there, check out our interactive chaser radar from our friends at zoomradar.com. If you'd like to contact us with questions or make comments about the show, shoot us an email to questions at stormfrontfreaks.com or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. Search for Stormfront Freaks. We'd love to hear from you. Join us next time and tell a friend about the Stormfront Freaks podcast.